All right, welcome back. Um, so we're starting a new unit of study uh, today. This is unit five called chemical bonding. Now we had looked at the three uh, the subatomic particles in detail. We looked at protons and neutrons in unit three and unit four was exclusively for electrons. And electrons are ostensibly the most important uh, subatomic particle because uh, they, uh, they uh, carry out chemical reactions or they're the purveyors of actual chemical reactions. And the way they do this is uh, these electrons form what are called chemical bonds. So in this unit of study, we're going to look at the different types of uh, chemical bonding. And uh, what that ultimately means is how atoms are bonded together into molecules. So with regards to uh, chemical reactivity, we had learned previously that uh, with regards to ions, an atom's ability or propensity to form an ion depends on its drive towards gaining that noble gas configuration uh, or an octet, if you like. And a couple of examples we looked at, um, whether we're picking up electrons uh, with respect to uh, nonmetals or giving up electrons with respect to metals, um, it's all the movement of electrons with uh, what we see over here with, with bromine with its seven valence electrons. If it picks up one electron, it can have an octet, that noble gas configuration, which uh, comes right after it, right after bromine. Uh, sodium, on the other hand, has one valence electron and instead of picking up electrons, it can instead dispense with an electron to become singly positively charged, but it also has uh, a noble gas configuration associated with it. So in both cases, it's, uh, those, those ions are stabilized by the fact that both of them have a noble gas configuration. And this isn't just for a single electron transfer, we can have any number of them. For instance, here was nitrogen with five valence electrons, likes to pick up three electrons to become triply negatively charged in anion. But look at that, it has a noble gas configuration. Uh, similarly, uh, magnesium, an alkaline earth metal with two valence electrons, is easier for magnesium to give up two electrons to become to become doubly positively charged cation, but again, having a noble gas configuration. So let's move that forward uh, into uh, actually forming a, uh, a, a chemical bond. And there, there's a, three different types of bonding that we'll look at in this unit of study, um, and we'll attack the first one right now. The first type of chemical bonding we're going to be looking at is, uh, is what is called ionic bonding, ionic bonding. So if you look on the lower left hand side here, we have what we're, we were talking about before when a sodium atom gives up one electron to become isoelectronic with the noble gas in this case, which preceded it to give that very, uh, that, that very stable, uh, singly positively charged sodium cation. But let's look at the fate of this electron. We don't just have electrons uh, uh, coming in or leaving. Um, they have to go somewhere. We, have to, we can't just give up an electron to the ether. Uh, since this is chemistry, that electron needs to end up somewhere. And that is where a second participant in a chemical reaction uh, can uh, take up the slack, if you will. Uh, for instance, if we had a chlorine atom with seven valence electrons nearby, it is only too happy to pick up that electron to become a, a singly negatively charged chlorine anion with a full octet. So here now we actually have a chemical reaction going on. Note we have a full electron transfer from sodium to chlorine. We're going to find that that is a, a benchmark or a, 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 a ionic bonding and uh, that the uh, overall uh, what's called a formula unit is charge neutral, meaning all of the positive charges cancel out all of the negative charges. It's one positive, one negative in this case, but they cancel to neutral. So let's look at some salient features of ionic bonding. How can we tell two elements will participate specifically in an ionic bond? Well, um, we'll take these a little out of order. Ionic bonds always occur between a metal and a non-metal. If it's not occurring between a metal and a non-metal, for instance, two metals or two non-metals, it's not ionic bonding. 
have to have a metal and a non-metal. So sodium here is our metal. If we look at a periodic table, we can confirm this. Chlorine here is a non-metal. They will, uh, if they form a chemical bond, it will be an ionic bond. Now, as uh, stated before, it involves a full electron transfer uh, exchange between atoms, full. And it is uh, cons also considered electrostatic, electro for electron, static for non-moving. That electron has gone from sodium over to chlorine, never to return. It is static. So therefore, what we have is that, that full electron transfer. That's going to gain some importance, that full electron transfer, when we compare it with other types of chemical bonding that don't have a full electron transfer. So we'll be able to compare and contrast ionic bonding with uh, different, uh, uh, different chemical bonding uh, to come. So now I may have spoken a little too soon when I said when atoms come together to, uh, and, and are, are bonded together through chemical bonds, we form molecules. That's not actually the case in, uh, in ionic compounds, which are compounds in which we have atoms that are bound together by ionic bonds. Instead of a molecule, um, we call uh, the, uh, the conglomeration of, uh, of atoms to form in ionic bonds a formula unit, not a molecule. And we're gonna see why that is. Uh, to define a formula unit, it is the smallest whole number ratio of cations to anions, which cancels to neutral, which means a zero charge, as, as we saw before. Um, now, uh, with uh, the sodium and chlorine that we looked at before, um, we find that what we have here is not a molecule. Notice I've put uh, that sort of dotted line around it. That's considered a formula unit, a one sodium to one chlorine. Uh, why? Because that, what, that one positive charge cancels out that one negative charge. That's a one-to-one -one formula unit. Ultimately, it is going to be written when we get into actually drawing these compounds out or writing chemical formulas as NaCl. NaCl, with the metal first, and the metal named first, and the non-metal always named second. Similarly, notice that the, the, uh, the charges, plus and minus, are not included in that uh, uh, chemical formula because it is implied. With ionic compounds, it is always implied that we cancel to neutral, so I don't have to, I can just call this NaCl rather than Na plus Cl minus because the, those uh, predictable ionic charges are implied and always in a chemical formula, it is going to, uh, in an, of an ionic compound, it is going to uh, cancel to neutral. So why, why don't we call these molecules? Let me clean this up a, a little bit here and, and, uh, and, and ask the question, um, why is this not a molecule? Well, you know, because it's an ionic bond holding it together, electrostatic. Uh, you know, we have this atom here, it's an ion now, and this ion there, what's not to, what's not to call a molecule? And the answer to this emerges when we look at a, say, a, a NaCl crystal. Um, here's an example. Now, I'm defining this, or I'm making the statement that there are no molecular boundaries on a crystal, uh, of an ionic crystal. Um, the entire crystal is the individual unit. Indeed, it is the entire molecule, if we were to call it that. So bear with me here. Here we have in this drawing, we have uh, uh, the, sort of these, these purple spheres that are given as uh, sodium cations, these green spheres, which are given as chlorine anions. Now, we can look at this and say, all right, well, what, what's the problem here? Here's the molecule. The molecule is right there. There it is, Na and Cl. What's the problem? Well, what if I was to say, no, you know, I don't think so. I think the molecule is right here, NaCl. That's exactly the same as the other one. And somebody else might say, no, no, the actual molecule is this one right here, or this one right here, or this one right here. You see, there's no defined molecular boundaries. It's just basically 
finding a, uh, uh, a sodium cation and a chlorine anion next to each other. Uh, so we can't really say that here starts a, uh, a molecule of NaCl and here ends a molecule of, of NaCl because it is, uh, there's so many choices. Is it this one or is it this one? That sort of thing. The other uh, interesting piece that, that comes from this is that if we, if we were to define an ionic substance or an ionic uh, uh, individual uh, uh, boundary as a molecule, well, the whole crystal would be the molecule. Indeed, uh, by that definition, if you're looking at a grain of salt, which is visible, you're really looking at the molecule of an ionic compound because it's only those boundaries of the crystal, for instance, starting here and ending there, can we really uh, specify boundaries. We really can't do that, as I showed before, because it's so ethereal, you know. Uh, you know, is this the formula unit or is this the formula unit or the molecule, if you will? Um, so uh, this is why we, uh, we don't call uh, these molecules of ionic compounds, but rather formula units of, uh, of ionic compounds. So we had broached this somewhat before, this concept of a chemical formula. And we're going to be learning all about chemical formulas of different types of compounds, but specifically for ionic compounds. How do I know there, for instance, in sodium chloride or the NaCl, that there's one sodium and one chlorine? Well, we saw that based upon their, uh, the, the, their uh, ionic charges. That was a plus one and a minus one ionic charge. That's one to one. They cancel to neutral. So we're going to be using that um, as we move forward to discern. If I were to ask you, what is the uh, chemical formula of the compound, the ionic compound formed between sodium and chlorine? You say, oh, NaCl. Um, uh, and, 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 and that would be a one to one. So let's look at some bullet points of this, and then we'll move into it. Typically, we're dealing with only binary compounds, meaning one type of cation, one type of anion. There are more complex types of compounds that we're going to be looking at, but we're dealing with uh, that the con this concept of binary compounds. Also, as we said before, in a chemical formula, the sum of the positive and negative charges must cancel to neutral, as we saw before. Um, <clears throat> once we work specifically with these ionic compounds, we're going to find whenever we draw these, we put the metal first, uh, the metal cation first, and the, uh, the, the non-metal, which forms the anion, second in these chemical formulas. So let's look at a, uh, a staged uh, stepwise process of how we would, uh, we would uh, go about finding out how to write chemical formulas, uh, given just a little bit of information. Okay, here's a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, a couple of representative problems. I've got a periodic table here for, uh, to help us through this. Um, the first example up top says, write the chemical formula for a compound of aluminum and sulfur. First of all, we have to uh, understand that this is going to be an ionic compound because aluminum is a metal and sulfur is a non-metal. There is aluminum over on the metal side here is sulfur on the non-metal side. So while I might say in a question well, uh, the ionic compound, I don't have to because it is, uh, we're readily able to figure that out from our copy of the periodic table. So basically when we're talking about a chemical formula, we're talking about the, putting the metal first and the non-metal second and dealing with subscripts subscripts uh, after the metal and the non-metal to talk about the relative numbers of each that comes up with that neutral formula unit. Like on, you know, H2O, well, that, that's not an ionic compound, but, uh, but that, that subscript two tells us there's two hydrogens and one, and one oxygen. Let's look forward on the, how would we approach this? That's ultimately what we're looking for in order to come up with this chemical formula. Okay. First thing to do is to place the metal first and the non-metal second, as we've done here. Then, from the periodic table, uh, we need to uh, 
put in our predictable ions, or if you want to work it out based upon the, four, that, the last unit of study, that's fine. And we find that aluminum takes on a uh, plus three cation, sulfur two minus anion, as we've sort of predicted from before. This is important because we're going to be using these uh, numbers, not the charges, but the breadth of the numbers on these uh, uh, on these charges to uh, or on these subscripts to uh, work out the chemical formula. So below in aluminum and sulfur, um, we need to then put the chemical uh, symbols of aluminum and sulfur with a little box in there. And those boxes are going to be where those uh, those subscripts are going to go. What the subscripts are we swap over the breadth of the charge on each of them, or the, the number of the charge, but not the actual charge. So we move the two from sulfur to subscript of aluminum, and the three, from, uh, three plus from aluminum to the subscript of the sulfur. Thus, the chemical formula for a compound of aluminum and sulfur is Al2S3. That is this, the uh, lowest common denominator of, of, uh, of each type. And uh, by doing this trick, it will always come up with a canceled to neutral uh, chemical formula, Al2S3. That cannot be reduced anymore, so thus it would be that proper chemical formula. Let's look at the next uh, example. Write the chemical formula for a compound of calcium and oxygen. Fair enough. First thing we do is we put the chemical symbols for calcium and oxygen down there with the metal first and the non-metal second. Next, we, through the periodic table, uh, predict what the charges are on, on the calcium and the oxygen and place them in there. Two plus for calcium because it's a, an alkaline earth. Uh, O2 minus for oxygen because it is in that proper column that we worked out last time. Next, we place the chemical symbols below uh, with uh, metal first, non-metal second, with those subscript boxes down there as before. Then, as before, we swap over the breadth of the number but not the charge from each one. In this case, they're both two. We would initially think that it's Ca2O2. And while that would be correct with respect to canceling to neutral, we have to have the lowest common denominator. Notice that each of these subscripts is further divisible by a common denominator of two, so really uh, it becomes CaO. Now notice, when one is the subscript on these chemical formulas, it is not written in there. It's, it's not Ca1O1, it's just CaO. That's just, a, uh, that, that's just by convention we do that, because in, in this case, the lowest common multiple of the subscripts would be 1. We divided both by 2, and uh, the proper answer would be CaO. So now, if you remember, uh, in the last unit of study, we came up with a way of expressing the Lewis structures for individual elements, which just was essentially the, uh, the, the element itself, the elemental symbol, with a number of dots around it, signifying the number of valence electrons around it. There was a particular way that we arranged those dots to eventually, on the, the, the elements further to the right on the periodic table possibly ended up with us show, having a mixture of uh, unpaired electrons and lone electron pairs. However, that was a Lewis structure of an individual element. Now we're going to start to introduce Lewis structures of compounds, of actual compounds. In this case, it is important to say that we're looking at the Lewis structure for an ionic compound, because that is going to be vastly different than a Lewis structure for another type of compound, which might be uh, defined by, uh, by another type of bonding. So Lewis diagrams for ionic compounds follow uh, a series of steps, and we'll look at the, the series of steps on an example here, and then we'll carry out uh, uh, another of our, of our own examples. First step in the Lewis diagram for an ionic compound would be to draw out the Lewis structure for both a metal and a non-metal. In this case, we have a, uh, a Lewis structure for, a, for an ionic compound of magnesium and oxygen. 
And I know it's an ionic compound uh, in this case because magnesium is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal. So it is going to be an ionic uh, structure. We looked at that in, in the last case. But in this case now, we're, so we, we, we have our uh, elemental Lewis structures here, that of magnesium here, that of oxygen there, showing the proper amount of valence electrons. Again, how do we know the number of valence electrons for an element? We count over in that currently open row on the periodic table until we reach a number where that element is. And in the case of magnesium, it is two. In the case of oxygen, it is six. So then what do we do? We'll show you a shortcut on this uh, moving forward. Well, we draw out the structure following complete electron transfer. And that, while that may uh, be a mouthful, um, what that really means is the metal will always, will never, I'm sorry, never have any dots around it. And the non-metal will always have four lone electron pairs around it, always. In any uh, Lewis diagram for an ionic compound, that is always the case. Metal, magnesium has nothing around it. The non-metal, oxygen, has four ele lone electron pairs around it. Next. We draw brackets around all the non-metal uh, atoms, in this case, oxygens. Nothing for poor magnesium. So really, it's the non-metals that get all the bling here, and the metals uh, really don't have a lot going on to them. The non-metals will, uh, no matter what, in any Lewis diagram for an ionic compound, will always have four pairs of electrons around it, will always have a series of brackets around it. Now, I should uh, mention that these are brackets. They're not braces, they're not parentheses, they are brackets. Fair enough. The last thing we do is to apply the ionic charges. Apply the ionic charges. Now, uh, if we look at this, these ionic charges, we could see that uh, this was sort of uh, front-loaded for this. Well, um, it's, a, it's one magnesium ion and one oxygen ion. That would be, you know, would be MgO if this were the uh, if this were the the chemical formula. So we only need one magnesium and one oxygen to do this. But let's look now uh, if we, we we might have to find uh, one in which we have a number of different uh, uh, a number of cations or a number of anions in there. To, to summarize, as before, if you forget everything, or, uh, remember this. The non-metal will always have eight electrons, meaning four electron pairs surrounding it, along with brackets. The metal never has any bling whatsoever, no electrons, no brackets surrounding it at all. Let's look at another example. So here is how a typical problem would present itself. Draw the ionic Lewis structure. Notice I said ionic. I didn't have to, uh, but I did. The ionic Lewis structure for a compound of barium and bromine. Now, uh, now barium, uh, I didn't have to say ionic Lewis structure because we see that barium is a metal and bromine is a, bromine is a nonmetal, or at least we would be able to see that by looking at a, a periodic table. Now, to approach this, we really have to do something first before we move into the construction of this ionic Lewis structure. We have to figure out the, uh, the uh, chemical formula uh, of a uh, compound of barium and bromine as we did previously. And uh, we carry that out by that sort of uh, shortcut switcheroo sort of uh, uh, thing where we see up here we have barium, it's a two plus cation because it's an alkaline earth. Bromine is a single negative charge because it's a halogen. And we uh, swap those numbers uh, to have one barium and two bromines. So thus, we in, in this ionic Lewis structure, we need to start by drawing two BRs and one BA, one two bromines and one barium. And I'm gonna do that so that this is how we start it. We couldn't start this without knowing the numbers of cations and anions. In this way, we do that. Um, so we have two bromines and a barium. And I've put them together here 
in sort of a, uh, uh, a, a nice uh, fashion that sort of slips, uh, that, that looks nice uh, and, and neat with bromines on, on either side. You don't need to do this. You could have the two bromines over there or following it or, or, or whatever. But uh, so there's no real way to, to, to carry this out. But we do need to uh, identify the nonmetals. And as before, those are the bromines. And we're going to put around each bromine, no matter what, uh, four lone electron pairs and brackets. And we do nothing at all with the barium, other than at the very end here, we are going to put the, uh, the charges uh, upon them. So the negative charges on the bromines and the two plus on the barium. And there we have uh, finished our, uh, our ionic Lewis structure for a compound of barium and bromine. So the previous slide finished us off for the to the extent that we're going to be looking into ionic bonding. And we're going to move into the next type of bonding, our chemical bonding that we're going to be talking about. This is going to take uh, a significant uh, amount more of time because this new type of bonding, covalent bonding, uh, has more intricacies to it that we're going to have to explore. But uh, let's uh, first take a look now at, uh, at, at the, some salient features of covalent bonding and see if we can't tease them apart from, uh, to make some differences between covalent bonding and what we just looked at, which was ionic bonding. The first one that jumps out is that covalent bonding is always between two nonmetals. Remember, ionic bonding was between two, a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent bonding is always between two nonmetals. Now, our pickings for nonmetals are much slimmer now, so that essentially is uh, you know, what we're looking at right here on our periodic table. Those are the nonmetals that are going to be coming together to form covalent bonds. Now, whereas ionic bonding involved complete electron transfer between partners, between uh, the, the, the two partners taking part in the ionic bond, Covalent bonding actually shares electrons between atoms. I mean, we can share electrons so that each atoms, each atom of the co forming a covalent bond can claim them in the formation of, uh, of an octet or a noble gas consideration, as, as, as written here. Both atoms get to claim the two electrons in the covalent bond uh, in order, as always in chemical bonding, to attain that noble gas configuration. Doesn't matter what type of bonding we're talking about, it's all about providing the uh, participants in that chemical bond a noble gas configuration which it, it can use. Now let's look at an example here uh, of a covalent bond, and we'll talk. We'll take a look at the uh, element hydrogen. Here is an atom, two atoms of hydrogen, written as their uh, Lewis electron dot structures. Now notice on the periodic table, I have hydrogen way over here with the metals. Indeed, it's placed in the uh, in the in the column of the alkali metals. This is yet another sort of. Uh, uh, weird uh, uh, setup of that first row on the periodic table. Remember, we saw that helium over here would fit real nicely into the S block, and indeed it should, but it's over on the other end because it signifies the end of an energy level. So uh, helium should really be in two places. Hydrogen, because it's the first element, needs to be right here to show that it's the first element, but really um, it, it acts as a non-metal and should perhaps uh, have some uh, occupancy over there. Really, the, uh, the, that first uh, row of those two elements on the periodic table is simply a conundrum. The short answer here is that hydrogen, which uh, is, is over here, it actually is a non-metal and acts as a non-metal. So here we go. Now, as uh, so here's a hydrogen atom and a similar one over on the other side. It is uncomfortable by nature. Why? Because with its one valence electron right here, it does not have a full octet, it, or rather it does not have a noble gas configuration. And it's thinking about, well, how might I do that? Well, if we, uh, he, uh, hydrogen says, geez, if I could pick up an electron, I would be isoelectronic with the two electrons that helium has. So how might I do that? 
I am a non-metal, so I can't uh, participate in a full electron transfer, but if, when, if I have a sample of, of many atoms uh, of hydrogen, well, uh, what could I do? So in a sample of hydrogen, we have two atoms sort of looking at each other. If we look over here on the, uh, on, on, on the left-hand side, and they say, well, what about this? We're two nonmetals. We could participate in a shared covalent bond. Let's take this single electron, and it's always unpaired electrons that do this, and throw in. We'll both throw them into the center. Now, one of the uh, constants of covalent bonding is it always involves two electrons, two electrons per covalent bond. And here we've thrown two electrons in. So what might be able to happen here? Well, if we look down here on the bottom, uh, we have two hydrogen atoms which are set up in sort of like a Venn diagram, uh, meaning that each hydrogen, this hydrogen over on this side can claim these two electrons. Well, similarly, the hydrogen over on this side here can also claim those two electrons. It's sort of like cheating on your taxes. You get this sort of double claiming, not saying that anybody does that, but uh, we, they each get to claim two electrons. They are both claiming uh, a helium, uh, a helium noble gas configuration, which is two electrons. So that concept of claiming to uh, the same electrons can uh, perhaps be a little, uh, a little weird, but that is indeed what they do. Both atoms claim the two shared electrons, and that means they're both now, can, since they're claiming them, isoelectronic with helium. Helium has that duet of electrons since it's on that first row of the periodic table. A duet is essentially an octet. It is, uh, it is a noble gas configuration. And ultimately, uh, what we end up with is a two-electron covalent bond resulting to always two electrons in a covalent bond. Now, interestingly, if we, if we look at this, uh, hydrogen uh, always comes as a packet. It is still an element because it's only hydrogen. However, um, it's always uh, comes in twos. It's considered a diatomic element. Diatomic because there's two atoms. Element because it's the same atoms. It's still the same element. So this Venn diagram of hydrogen that I showed you, uh, showing those uh, two shared electrons, is usually not the way one would express a, uh, a covalent bond. If you remove the Venn structure, though, there is a uh, type of uh, uh, expression of a covalent bond which, which, uh, which is valid. This uh, one we see here are two hydrogen atoms with the two dots in the middle sort of uh, positioned vertically. Those two do vertical dots represent a two electron covalent bond. Now, I will say that the expression in this fashion, uh, one almost never sees it like that. Virtually always, it is given as a line between the two chemical symbols, as, as we see here. Uh, that is about 99% of the time a covalent bond. That line uh, is how a covalent bond is expressed. And indeed, as we move forward, I will be doing the same. Uh, using lines as opposed to those uh, those dots between the between the two atoms. Um, so whenever we see a line, uh, a covalent bond right there, what that means is there's two electrons being shared between uh, each of the uh, participants in that covalent bond, affording virtually always a noble gas configuration uh, between them. There is sort of a condensed way of, uh, of expressing this uh, hydrogen, which is a diatomic element. We'll see other diatomic elements moving forward, but that would be with this subscript 2 placed after it, um, H2. Hydrogen always exists as a diatom. So when we talk about uh, doing a, a written expression for hydrogen, um, we, we say H2. So don't, don't uh, hand me that little tank of H, will you? No. What we say is hand me the sample or tank of H2, and people will know what you're talking about because hydrogen is indeed a diatomic element. Let's look at some more elements that... Uh, will uh, that, that uh, express themselves or exist as diatoms. 
So again now, the driving force between the formation of two nonmetals in, into a covalent bond structure is, uh, is, is towards providing both participants in that covalent structure a noble gas configuration by sharing claim of the covalent bond electrons. And let's look at some representative nonmetals just as their elements and uh, see how they might be able to work together to uh, allow each uh, allow themselves a noble gas configuration. Here are two atoms of chlorine. We can say in a sample uh, of chlorine. And notice that each of these have uh, seven valence electrons, as any halogen uh, will have. And uh, say, so if we have a sample just of chlorine atoms, what are they thinking? And how, how, why were they going to uh, uh, come together to allow themselves not seven valence electrons, but a full octet of them? So, as before, two uh, uh, chlorine atoms in this sample look at each other and say, I think we can help each other out. We're both feeling uncomfortable because we have seven valence electrons. Uh, what if we took our unpaired electron, and again, it's always the unpaired electrons, not the lone electron pairs that do this uh, uh, formation of covalent bonds. What if we threw in with our, that, that, uh, lone, that, uh, lone electron that each of us have as such and formed a covalent bond out of it. Each of those unpaired electrons comes together to form that covalent bond, again, written as a line, written as a line. So let's count now each of these chlorines now can, what can they claim? Well, this chlorine over on the left can claim two, four, six, eight electrons. Happy chlorine, because it has a full octet. The sa same with this, because it's symmetrical on the, on the right-hand side, two, four, six, and laying claim to that common set of two electrons in the middle, that's also eight. So indeed, uh, chlorine, and indeed any other halogen, uh, not just chlorine, um, exist as diatomic species. All other halogens, fluorine, bromine, iodine, could be substituted in there because they have identical Lewis structure. If they have identical Lewis structure, it doesn't matter what the chemical symbol is. That Lewis structure are just the valence electrons, and those are identical. So we could have uh, Cl2, F2, Br2, I2. Uh, all the halogens would exist as diatoms. All right. Let's move over one step and let's look. Uh, let's look at oxygen in the periodic table. Uh, that would uh, that, that that's a common uh, one. And oxygen has six valence electrons. We can count them: two unpaired electrons, two lone pairs of electrons. Six is not happy. So we have unhappy oxygens. And in a sample of oxygen where there are only there are only other oxygen atoms kicking around. Uh, they have to do something about that. So let's see what they might be able to come up with. One oxygen looks at another oxygen atom and says, hey, I notice you have some unpaired electrons. Let's do what chlorine just did and throw in and make, make a common, elect, uh, common covalent bond between us. And now let's count up this uh, oxygen on the left, two, four, six electrons and seven not eight. Similarly, the oxygen on the right, two, four, six, seven. So one, that's, that's not going to do it, is it? So uh, chlorine was able to achieve a full octet doing that, but oxygen was not. So this uh, uh, oxygen uh, uh, diatom now looks at itself and says, hey, we have each have a one more unpaired electron. What if we threw those in? Oh, and made another covalent bond. Yes, you can have multiple covalent bonds. Look what we have here. We have covalent bond here, which is two electrons claimed, shared, and two electrons here in this covalent bond, two electrons shared. So now each oxygen is going to add up. Let's look at the oxygen on the left. Two, four, six, eight. Ah, happy oxygen. Yes. 
And the same would be said since it's symmetrical, the oxygen on the right would be just as happy as well. Oxygen is a diatomic species. It will always exist as O2. You never say, hand me the tank of O. It's always, hand me the tank of O2. We see this uh, everywhere in the media, in commercialism, O2. Why is it O2? Well, now we know. Let's look at one, uh, one last one here, nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen has five valence electrons written as we see here with three unpaired electrons and, and one lone electron pair. And nitrogen says, let's just do what we did before. Let's throw in with our unpaired elect one of our unpaired electrons and get what we see, uh, see here. And each nitrogen is now gonna count. What do I get? I want eight, two, four, five, six. Ah, not eight, not enough. But each nitrogen says, hey, we have a couple more unpaired electrons. Let's throw in again and see what happens. Now we're double, we a double covalent bond like oxygen did, and now we count. Two, four, six, seven. Oh, still not enough. We're one short of that magic number of eight, that full octet. Well, look at this. We Each nitrogen says we still each have one unpaired electron. So let's throw that in. Wow. Nitrogen, did we have a, a triple covalent bond? Yes, a triple covalent bond can indeed occur, and we can do that. So we have a triple covalent bond, uh, and uh, we have notice on all of these uh, diatoms. We have N2 here. We have O2 here, and we have Cl2, or indeed any halogen, over here. It's the unpaired electrons that form these covalent bonds. Look what happens to the lone electron pairs. They just end up sitting on their respective atoms. So here, up here on the upper right-hand side is nitrogen. We have three unpaired electrons, and we have that uh, one uh, lone electron pair. Well, look what happens in N2. There's that lone electron pair. It just stays there. It doesn't react. It just continues to sit on that nitrogen. Similarly, with, uh, with all of our other uh, uh, covalent structures, those lone electron pairs remain on the, uh, on the actual atoms. They don't uh, react, but rather they remain. So to summarize, with respect to uh, diatomic elements, there are seven of them that occur in nature, and we've really looked at all of them. We, start, we started with hydrogen. Hydrogen exists as H2. Why do any of them exist as diatoms? It's always to provide each of the participants in that covalent bond a noble gas configuration. So we saw that uh, pre pre previously with hydrogen. With all four of our uh, halogens, it's the same thing. We, we uh, did it with chlorine, but fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. They are indeed diatomic elements as well. And as we saw on the last slide uh, as well, um, oxygen is a diatom, as is nitrogen, O2 and N2, respectively. So up to this point, we've presented covalent bonding only with uh, b between uh, identical atoms. And honestly, to just show that uh, seven elements in the periodic table can exist as diatomic elements. But it turns out that covalent bonding also occurs between different nonmetals. That's very important, as, as we'll see. As long as they're nonmetals or act as nonmetals, uh, we can form a covalent, bo covalent bonds between them. And again, the impetus for this to happen is to uh, allow for a noble gas configuration to exist between all of the atoms participating in the covalent structure. So let's look at these, uh, these atoms I've put here, placed somewhat suggestively, and, uh, and ask ourselves, well, uh, all of them, carbon with its four valence electrons and hide those hydrogens with their one valence electron, all of them are uncomfortable. Indeed, uh, they would all like to attain a noble gas configuration, so how might that occur? Well, carbon might say to a passing hydrogen, uh, 
hey, we are a passing, a bunch of passing hydrogens. I think we could all work together um, to throw in our unpaired electrons. Remember, it's only unpaired electrons. Throw in these unpaired electrons to uh, come up with a structure that uh, benefits us all. And notice those throw in, throwing in of, of, of these electrons. Now we've got all these lines here. These lines are two electron covalent bonds. And now we're going to count and see whether uh, that uh, all atoms within this structure are indeed satisfied. Let's look at carbon first. Carbon can now claim two, four, six, eight electrons. Since there's two electrons in each line or each covalent bond, that is a happy carbon. Now, each of, the, uh, each of the hydrogens here can claim two electrons. Remember, that's a duet. That is helium. So every hydrogen in this case, I won't write them all in because they're identical, but every hydrogen is very happy as well. So indeed, this is a, uh, th th this is a, a very common compound that we have right here. If it can exist according to the uh, the, the rules of uh, covalent bonding, uh, it probably does exist. And this is uh, this uh, molecule right here is a molecule of uh, what is known as methane, um, very stable molecule because of all, all of the, the non-metal participants in that, uh, in, in that structure, all, they all have a noble gas configuration. So let's expand this into uh, a, a type of a model that we're going to be moving as we move forward, we're using as we move forward uh, for uh, uh, when discussing covalent bonding. So the predictor we're going to be using here is called the standard bonding model. And there's many ways of expressing that standard bonding model, and we're going to get quite used to this. But uh, in general, and at, this is as we've seen before, the number of unpaired electrons in, in an element's uh, Lewis structure indicates how many covalent bonds it will have emanating from it. So let's look at uh, some very common uh, non-metals, non and we'll put them across here, written suggestively in a, in a, in a little bit of a different way than we normally express a, uh, uh, an elemental Lewis structure. So we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine and as we know their uh, uh, their valence electrons are expressed uh, around the periphery of each uh, ele elemental symbol what i have put in here which we haven't seen before are these rectangular boxes around each of them uh, and that is just to show that each rectangular box can hold two electrons but, uh, but it starts by filling singly first. And as we can see in this carbon, uh, 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 carbon structure here, this carbon electron dot model, each of those rectangles is, has one electron within it. Right next to carbon in the periodic table to the, to the right of it is, uh, is nitrogen. And where do we put that next uh, uh, where do we put that next electron? Well, we have to double up. And indeed, right here now, we have two electrons populating that, that rectangle. It's just to show, just to, to be able to tally electrons around it. So in this case, as we saw before, this is where now we, uh, we are able to, to discern on this electron structure on nitrogen between one lone electron pair and three unpaired electrons. So remember, we made that distinction uh, before with that. And as we move along, as we continue to add electrons in there, uh, now oxygen has two unpaired electrons, two lone electron pairs, and fluorine, and indeed any halogen, has three lone electron pairs and one unpaired electron. We are going to be focusing only on the unpaired electrons. So if we look at something like carbon, how many unpaired electrons does it have? Clearly, it has four unpaired electrons. Thus, the standard bonding model states that how the carbon will have four covalent bonds emanating from it always in, an, in the standard bonding model, in any standard bonding situation. And if we, uh, as we saw on the last slide, if we brought in some, uh, some hydrogen atoms for that, we're able to make, uh, uh, we're able to make methane right here. This methane molecule, indeed, look at the carbon at the center, uh, has indeed 
four covalent bonds uh, emanating from it. Why is that? Because it has four unpaired electrons in its Lewis structure. Moving over to nitrogen, we see nitrogen has one lone electron pair and three unpaired electrons. That means the standard bonding model predicts that nitrogen in, uh, in a typical bonding situation will have three covalent bonds emanating from it. And indeed it will. If we bring in hydrogen atoms as we did before with the uh, previous example, we find that this is the uh, uh, type of structure we're going to come up with. How do I know that? Well, that there's three covalent bonds emanating from nitrogen because it had three low, uh, uh, unpaired electrons uh, on its Lewis structure. And we were able to, to, look at, to look at that. This is a very stable system right here. Uh, it's a very common molecule. In fact, this is known, this is known as ammonia, NH3. Uh, very, very stable because as you'll see, here we can look at nitrogen. Let's count with respect to that central atom. How many atom or how many electrons can it claim? Two, four, six, eight. Happy nitrogen. And indeed, all of the hydrogens in there are happy as well because they can claim a duet, uh, which is isoelectronic with helium. Um, here's an example now of uh, going from actual uh, elements to their, uh, to their uh, covalent structures, what do we see here? Um, that any uh, lone electron pairs, which existed on the element, are carried through and just sit on that same element in the final covalent bonding structure. So we see this yet again with ammonia. Right uh, to the right of nitrogen in the periodic table is oxygen with one more uh, one more valence electron, total of six, giving us two lone electron pairs and two unpaired electrons. So with two unpaired electrons, how many covalent bonds will emanate from oxygen in a typical bond sit bonding situation? Well, the standard bonding model predicts two. And indeed, if we brought in two hydrogen atoms, as we've done uh, before, we end up with what we see right here. This is a, a sort of a strange way of drawing it, but this is water, H2O, one oxygen, two hydrogens. And if we look at this, let's be carefully look at the oxygen uh, in the center of this water molecule. Let's count how many uh, electrons it can claim, two, four, six, eight. Again, it has an octet because the standard bonding model allows for that. So here we have a very, very common molecule, that of water. Um, the oxygen has a full octet, noble gas configuration. Each hydrogen can claim two atoms. That's a duet. That is a, a helium configuration. So everybody is happy. Lastly, Right to the right of oxygen in the periodic table on that second row is fluorine. And this applies to uh, indeed any halogen, you know, below it, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Um, they all have identical Lewis structure. And that Lewis structure tells us on fluorine here, and indeed any halogen, we have three lone electron pairs and one unpaired electron. Let's bring in uh, a hydrogen atom. And indeed, what we end up with is uh, uh, this is hydrofluoric acid again it's a very stable structure because fluorine itself can claim two four six eight electrons and uh, the and the hydrogen within it can 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 uh, claim a duet a helium uh, a helium uh, noble gas configuration notice the uh, again in the past two examples the lone electron pairs that existed on the element exist on the element in its bonded form as well for oxygen two lone electron pairs gets carried through for fluorine and any halogen three lone electron pairs gets carried through as well 